Welcome to the cinematic world of State Fair, a 1962 movie that's more than just a glimpse into the fairgrounds. Curious about lesser known facts or anecdotes that add a fascinating layer to this film? Stick around. There are funny, shocking, and sad revelations waiting to unfold. What makes this movie an everlasting symbol of the industry? Is it the timeless charm, the relatable characters, or something else entirely? As we delve into the narrative, you might find your own answers. Now, here's the hook buckle up, because there's a roller coaster of facts heading your way. Some might even leave you wide-eyed. So, keep watching. Before we dive in, we're curious what's your most cherished memory or personal experience related to this cinematic gem. Share your stories and memories in the comments below. Your narrative might just add another layer to the richness of steak fare. Ready for a journey through the reels of nostalgia? Let's press play on the past and uncover the layers of steak fare. Your anecdotes and insights are the missing pieces to this cinematic puzzle. Don't be shy. Drop your thoughts below. Excited to hear your stories. In this rendition of State Fair, the familiar narrative unfolds as the Frake family prepares for the annual event with individual aspirations. Father Yule is eager to showcase his prize hog blue boy, while Mother Fay aims for success in the mincemeat competition. Son Boone seeks revenge in the car races, and daughter Tiffin yearns for excitement in her life. As they navigate the fair, unexpected romances emerge for the younger Frakes. Yule's character fluctuates between amusing and blank, with moments of charm interspersed. Faye, returning from a 15-year hiatus, appears slender and attractive, but struggles with a role that falls short of her previous memorable performances. Boone, on the other hand, fits well into his role, delivering a wholesome and sincere performance, showcasing his singing talents. Tiffin's portrayal lacks expressiveness and veers into wooden territory, with her attempted accent being a particular drawback. Darren, the TV reporter covering the fair, lacks chemistry with Tiffin, making their connection feel forced. Meanwhile, Margaret's appeal is evident as she captivates with a campy rendition of Isn't It Kind of Fun? The film, however, deviates from the simple origins of the story, altering elements such as the men's meat competition and carnival games, resulting in a less cohesive and appealing narrative. Despite a seed of interest in the plot, the added songs fail to capture the unifying essence of the original. Boone's DVD commentary, though unintentionally amusing, highlights the disconnect between the film's touted family values and the character's questionable actions. The story's transformation, while attempting modernization, falls short and loses the charm that made the original versions appealing. In summary, this rendition of State Fair struggles to recapture the essence of its predecessors, with notable deviations from the simplicity that once defined the story. The performances vary in quality, and the attempts at modernization result in a film that feels recycled and lacks the unifying charm of the original narrative. This review aims to provide a neutral perspective for those unfamiliar with the film, allowing them to gauge its merits without the influence of personal anecdotes or humor. In the 1962 rendition of State Fair, notable changes were made from its 1945 predecessor. The relocation of the setting from Iowa to Texas necessitated the omission of the well-known Rogers and Hammerstein song, All I Owe Iowa Richard Rogers, however, crafted a replacement, It's the Little Things in Texas, performed by Alice Faye and Tom Ewell. Faye's musical moment in the film, Never Say No, underwent edits in the final release, reducing it to one verse and a chorus. Interestingly, the complete pre-recording of the song can be found on the Dot Records original soundtrack album. A peculiar aspect arises in the 1999 Verse Saraband compact disc remastering of the soundtrack. The orchestral timing discrepancy is evident, with the orchestra consistently lagging or leading the singers on various tracks, notably noticeable on more than just a friend. These insights provide a glimpse into the nuances and modifications made in the 1962 adaptation of State Fair, shedding light on the creative decisions shaping its musical landscape. It's a fascinating exploration of how alterations in locale and post-production choices can impact the cinematic experience. Barbara Eden and Andy Williams underwent screen tests for the roles later portrayed by Anne Margaret and Bobby Darren. Eden, displaying significant vocal talent, showcased her abilities years later in the television production of Kismet, where she portrayed Lalon. The nail-biting speedway sequence was authentically filmed at the Oklahoma State Fair Raceway in Oklahoma City. 
The enduring Great Plains Coca-Cola bottling facility on May Ave serves as a backdrop, its grandstands having been demolished in August 2010. Initially planned for Tadeo, a 65mm process with 70mm prints, the film ultimately adopted 35mm cinemascope, likely due to budget constraints. While some test footage and exterior shots were in 65mm, the existing material remains part of the Fox stock film library. This insightful information sheds light on the casting considerations, authentic location filming, and the film format shift during the production of State Fair in 1962, providing a glimpse into the filmmaking decisions shaping its narrative. All data is reliably sourced, ensuring accuracy in the details presented. Anita Gordon, not Marie Green as some sources suggest, provided the singing voice for Pamela Tiffin in the 1962 adaptation of State Fair. Gordon later extended her vocal support to Gene Seberg in Paint Your Wagon. Intriguingly, a seldom seen end title sequence graces very few prints of the film. This sequence features a choral rendition of It's a Grand Night for singing accompanying a photo montage of the cast. Derived from an outtake, Tiffin's footage seems out of place, set in her bedroom, an area unseen in the film. This footage likely originated from an alternate take of it might as well be spring, initially filmed in Margie's bedroom, but discarded in favor of an outdoor version in the final release print. The strategic move during the 1962 State Fair release involved halting the distribution of earlier versions to avoid competition. The 1933 film vanished for decades, reappearing in the 1990s. The 1945 version resurfaced on television as it happened one summer, minimizing confusion with the 1962 release, which was also leased to local TV stations. Returning to 20th Century Fox after nearly 17 years, Alice Faye came out of retirement to reunite with friends from her Fox days, Don Amici and director Henry King. However, Amici was replaced by Tom Ewell and director Jose Furrer took the helm. In a notable shift, Wally Cox made his film debut in this production. Director Jose Furrer's son, Gabriel, later married Debbie Boone, the daughter of Pat Boone. These personal connections add an interesting dimension to the film's behind-the-scenes dynamics. All this information is sourced from a reliable website, providing straightforward insights into the casting changes and personal connections within the production of State Fair in 1962. It's a glimpse into the human aspect behind the camera, offering a unique perspective on the film's development. In the 1962 adaptation, Pat Boone and Bobby Darin never share a scene echoing the non-interaction between Anne Margaret and Pamela Tiffin. Interestingly, both actresses later co-starred in The Pleasure Seekers. The film's lush score, unmistakably crafted by 20th Century Fox's Alfred Newman and Ken Darby, reflects their prior successful collaborations on Rogers and Hammerstein projects. Their expertise in enhancing musical compositions, utilizing multi-track stereophonic sound, is evident in the film's rich adaptation compared to the more modest 1945 version. Newman and Darby's partnership extended beyond State Fair, including notable works like Daddy Long Legs and How the West Was Won. Anne Margaret made her cinematic debut in this film, shot before her generally recognized debut in Pocketful of Miracles, which was released prior to State Fair. All details are derived from a reputable website, ensuring accuracy in the information presented. Fox revisited Phil Stone's novel thrice, with the 1962 adaptation recycling the 1945 song score in stereo and widescreen. Despite initial dismissal, it has gained a loyal following over the years. In promotional materials for the film, Anne Margaret is flanked by a female chorus, yet on screen, the act features only male performers. During pre-production, director Jose Furr suggested Anne Margaret switch from a brunette to a red-haired look, a dazzling transformation that became her signature style. All source details come from a reputable website ensuring accuracy. This sheds light on the film's evolution and unique aspects.